in addition to grounding my heart, my own soul, my thinking, and my actions in an ecological and historical perspective, the two things that Connie and I are regularly do for ourselves and we encourage for others is one – to understand, and we've taught on this for the whole time of, of you know the 19 years of our itinerant ministry, and, and now that we're just settled down, we, I imagine continuing to teach on this, this understanding that death is sacred, death is necessary, death is holy, uh, and that you can't even have a universe without death. And the combination of that with a sense of identity, that myself doesn't stop with my skin, that in a very real and totally deep way, my larger body is the biosphere, is the solar system, is the Milky Way, is the universe, and is whatever that great mystery is in which this universe and possible multiple other universes is part of. So myself is this larger this universal self and or cosmic self or, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, but when you realize that, when I realize that, then I'm no longer, not only am I not afraid of my own death, but I'm not afraid of our species death because my sense of identity is with that. That was post gloom eco theologian, Michael Dowd. He and I will be shining the light of evolutionary and ecological wisdom on this moment in time, this time of fires, floods, plagues, and collapse. And we'll especially explore the psychological and relational journey into sanity and integrity with reality. I'm Terry Patton, and this is State of Emergence. Today, I'm really happy to be in conversation with my dear friend, Michael Dowd. He and his wife, Connie, are dear, esteemed personal friends. Michael's quite somebody here. Uh, his 2006 book, Thank God for Evolution, was endorsed by many Nobel laureates, uh, science luminaries, skeptics, and religious leaders across the spectrum. He's also a uh, a prominent and accomplished speaker and teacher, having delivered programs for TEDx, the United Nations, Caltech, and uh, three acclaimed online conversation series, The Advent of Evolutionary Christianity in 2011, The Future is Calling Us to Greatness in 2015, and his current project with Connie, Post Doom, Regenerative Conversations Exploring Overshoot grief, grounding, and gratitude. Michael and Connie, and by the way, Connie's a noted science writer and evolutionary educator, uh, a fellow climate activist, and really quite a leader in assisted migration of trees. They've lived an inspiring itinerant lifestyle since 2002, living at least part of the time in their uh, van, uh, Angel, and traveling together and speaking to some 3,000 groups of people throughout North America. Michael was trained in, as a Christian, essentially pastor, and, and often during those early years called himself the evolutionary evangelist. And it was then that I was lucky enough to get to know Michael and Connie. Uh, Michael has read and recorded on a webpage they've established called Grace Limits some thousand hours of books that were influential on drawing them to a more radically ecological view. Basically seeing that the collapse of industrial civilization in, in their view was inevitable, but that that didn't delete meaning and purpose, but that there were many, many different confusions and attitudes and ideas that needed to be deconstructed and released in order for us to get real, as he puts it, get right with reality. God is reality. They really were way showers to me. I got exposed to numerous books through Michael and Connie, and 
although our way of orienting has always had some distinctions, we've been uh, dear friends in the fact that when, once we're together in time and space, what we all want to do is get out in nature, jump into uh, natural bodies of water. And so there's just a kind of vitality of what it is to be a part of this living nature that we share at root. And that's one of the reasons that our, our friendship is so rich and why I'm so happy to be here today with you right now, Michael. Welcome. Thank you, Terry. It's a it's an honor to be with you always, and in this conversation series, um, state of emergence at this incredible time of uh, challenge. Let's just say it that. Yes, exactly. Well, Michael, I think it's really valuable for us to assume that some of our listeners, even if they have some familiarity with aspects of your work may not be up to date with how mm -hmm. you see things right now. And you've been on an incredible journey these last seven or eight years. So help us or help orient us this momentous moment. What is it? What matters? What's worth considering? What is of vital importance right now? What, what's mm -hmm. alive? Well, thanks for the question. Yeah, I guess the first thing I want to say is that this is the first conversation. This is the first piece of ministry or our first work that I'm doing in an entirely new era because for the last almost 19 years, Connie and I have traveled North America speaking in secular and religious settings of all kinds, literally atheist evangelicals and everything in between. Um, and um, uh, basically where science, inspiration, and sustainability intersect. At that intersection is what virtually all of our programs have been. And I'm speaking to you from Ypsilanti, Michigan, where we just moved to literally two weeks ago. And we're settling down because, A, I don't need to travel to speak because now in a COVID era, I can do programs via Zoom uh, to, in secular and religious settings. Um, both sermons on Sunday mornings and evening programs and stuff like that. Um, so I don't have to travel. And frankly, we want to be close to granddaughter. We've got a four-month-old granddaughter two blocks away. So literally, after this conversation uh, today, I'm going to walk over and spend two hours with my granddaughter, as I do almost every afternoon. And to be close to family, to be close to granddaughter, to be close to also my first wife, uh, uh, Allison, and her husband, Charles, only live 20 minutes away. So in these crazy times, being close to family is just deeply soul nourishing. And the fact that all I need is good internet to continue doing the work that I do uh, is uh, icing on the cake. So a little more background. Uh, as you mentioned, for the first uh, 12 and a half, almost 13 years uh, of ministry, um, my focus was really on evolutionary evangelism and, and evolution was primary and virtually everything else was secondary. Um, and I was very much on a techno-optimist, uni, unidirectional, somewhat human-centered understanding of things. Uh, basically, uh, Thomas Berry was a, and Joanna Macy and many others were mentors from the late 80s. Um, and I was very much into bioregionalism and permaculture and sustainability. I've done permaculture training and deep ecology and all this kind of stuff. But then in 2000, I read Ken Wilber and trained with Don Beck and, and read several other books that put me on a more linear human-centered trajectory of evolution and of human history. And it wasn't until December 3rd of 2012 that I uh, was rocked out of that world by watching David Roberts' TED Talk called Climate Change is Simple. And I wept and I woke Connie up and we both watched it. We both wept and I ordered a half a dozen books that afternoon. Uh, Bill McKibben's Earth, uh, James Hansen's Storms of My Grandchildren and Al Gore's The Future and Paul Gilding's The Great Disruption and a couple of others, and really began studying climate change uh, and abrupt climate change in a very serious, passionate way, spending 20 or 30 hours a week reading. And then, as you mentioned, also recording some of the best books and, and uh, essays and things um, related to that. Um, in fact, all my recordings, virtually all of them can be found on SoundCloud uh, freely th there. Uh, if you just put Grace Limits uh, audios, Michael Dowd, Grace Limits, you'll find my audios. And, um, and so these last seven years, I've really gone from seeing everything. Basically, I was aware of one fundamental problem, climate, 
And then like by 2000, late 2013, early 2014, I became aware of many problems and then became aware of the interconnection between the many problems. And then by January of 2014, 2015, I read William Catton's book, Overshoot, which as you know, is the most important book I've ever read in my life. And Connie too. And that's when I realized we're not dealing with a problem or even a set of problems. We are really dealing with a predicament that uh, we have to adapt to. There's, it, there is no solution. Uh, there are no solutions to predicaments. Uh, you have to live with them or die with them or adapt to them or whatever. And so that's, that's the world I've been living in. And now I'd say really the heart and soul of everything that I do is trying to help people understand our predicament because understanding brings clarity and also just sort of evaporates confusion because so much of the angst and the frustration and the anger and depression that people feel is because they don't understand why we are in the situation we are, why we're dealing with these cascading predicaments. And when they do have this historical understanding and this ecological understanding, now ecology is for, foreground and evolution and everything else is background. Uh, because if you interpret evolution or, or ecology in light of evolution, you can have a, a distorted human-centered understanding, anthropocentric understanding. And so now ecology really is the heart of my theology. And the, the essence of what I'm trying to do is give people clarity about why we are in the mess we are, why it's been unavoidable, and, it's, it, it, and, and what, what we can be in these times of tremendous uncertainty. There are, there are clusters of things we can be confidently certain of, not arrogant, but really grounded in a knowing of certainty. And then when that clarity comes and you, you give people the tools or invite people to, to do the heart work of processing whatever feelings of, of grief, of despair, of, of frustration, of anger – then we can come to that place that Paul Traferka speaks about on the other side of merely acceptance of the stages of grief, which we all have to do. We all, and sometimes we spiral through that, but we, on the other side of acceptance is finding the gift. And so most of my work now is helping people to understand, give them some tools to do the emotional work, but that also ultimately to live from the place of, okay, here's what's real. Now what's possible and live out of that place of possibility um, in light of reality. And that's where you can find so much joy and so much generosity and compassion and camaraderie so that it's possible to live a tremendously blessed life, even in the midst of contracting, collapsing times. Yes. And that's been the focus, really, of your post-Doom conversation series, uh, which people can find on on YouTube. You have essentially decided, hey, those of us who have faced this predicament to any real degree have had to go through a journey at the level of the soul, at the level of our psychology, our spirituality, our sense of meaning, our sense of purpose, our identity in very fundamental existential terms. And you've wanted to have conversations with people who are a little bit on the front edge of the wave of, of, of facing what you think it will all eventually be facing. We do live in a culture of denial in which most people have not faced these things. But as people wake up to reality, there's this journey. And you've wanted to talk with others about their journey. And in that process, you've looked at this from a lot of different angles, and you've felt into it in resonance with a lot of different human beings. And out yeah. of that journey, you have uh, oriented to a few things that you think are especially important and especially uh, useful for others to feel into and to, you know, be combine themselves with in order to be deepened and transformed and, and quickened in their ability to show up in their lives and appreciate what is given. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the, the post doom, the best place, just postdoom.com is where people can learn about it and they, they see all the, the you know, the uh, conversations. I've had about 75 conversations, including one with you. If people want to go deep into this, uh, the sort of the inspiring side of what often gets characterized, unfortunately, as doom and gloom. I mean, I don't, I don't get invited into integral settings anymore because most integralists, I mean, you're one of the rare exceptions of people who really have a green 
green heart, a deep green heart, and who aren't afraid to look at the reality of that there is no such thing as perpetual progress. There are two forms of human organization in, in human history. The first 97 to 98% of human history, it was all about stability. It was all about no change. It was almost ahistorical. It was all about taking the wisdom from your ancestors and being in right relationship to your ancestors, imaginatively, of course, but taking that wisdom and then passing it faithfully to the descendants, the seventh generation. And so it was all, it was the opposite of the telephone game, which is where things change. It was all about stability, constancy, passing that deep ecological wisdom on. Um, so that's most of human history. It's been about that, uh, which is what I call pro-future cultures, cultures that live in a way that preserves the biosphere rather than manipulating the biosphere for so-called human progress. It preserves the biosphere and ultimately understands that there is no progress of humans at the expense of the living world upon which we depend. Then there are progress and regress cultures. Over the last 7,000 years, there's boom and bust cultures. And those are city-based city civilizations. Agricultural city-based civilizations always, with no exceptions, go through a boom and bust, which is where progress is undeniable and regress is undeniable. And then a dark age. And then a different culture. Progress is undeniable. And then regress. It's carrying capacity surplus on the way up. You overshoot the carrying capacity and then carrying capacity deficit, population pressure, conflicts, and everything else. And so you're one of the very few integralists who really get that um, and have articulated it. Your, your Google talk was fabulous, uh, many of your other presentations too, but that one was especially good in bringing Catton in and all. I still deeply am passionate about helping people to be present to what's real, like what's evidentially unarguably true, and then to do the hard work, and then ultimately to spend the rest of their lives as a blessing to the future, as a blessing to their community, to whatever degree they can, given their gifts and limitations. And, and that, that, that reckoning has a lot of different expressions. Uh, some of my closest friends have made radical changes and are now living in eco villages and attempting to embody something closer to a sustainable presence on the planet. Some right. are completely committed to uh, on the ground activism in ways that have an important short term impact, but may not be able to address the most intractable aspects of our predicament, doing things like political activism to elect less unenlightened leaders and, and so forth. Some are resorting primarily to, you know, well, hey, we're I'm going to be dead. There's going to be a big winnowing of the human population. This is going to be kind of grim. Uh, let me deepen my spiritual practice so that I have that unshakable ground of trust in being that in, can enable me to be fundamentally grateful and accepting of whatever is and a source of sanity and stability to those around me. Exactly. But all of us in different ways are completely bound into this consumer economy, society, technologically driven industrial civilization. And the, exactly. the, the fact that in a sense, therefore, all of us are deeply adapted to a self-terminating pattern uh, mm -hmm. arises for many people as uh, a kind of a wound, like I'm complicit in the destruction of my grandchildren's future. I feel terrible about that. I, I, I can't seemingly accept that. I've got to somehow get right with God before I could even look at myself in the mirror. But then as your analysis gets more and more thorough, the recognition comes that you can never get completely right with it. And, and, <laughs> and how much do you forgive yourself for the plastic bag that, you know, the thing you bought came in? This, this has been a disorienting dilemma for everybody I know. Thomas Berry used to famously say to people, I drove a car here to tell you how bad cars are. You know, it's like we're living in systems that are, are literally millennia long, human centered, anti-future 
uh, in other words, ecocidal or self-destructive systems. And none of us, very few of us could step outside of it. I mean, I, I was a member of one of the first permaculture-based eco-villages in, in North America, Earth Haven Village, just outside of Asheville, North Carolina, Black Mountain, North Carolina. And, um, and I still, uh, you know, I'm doing everything that I can to promote permaculture and bioregionalism and uh, all forms of regenerative agriculture, regenerative uh, building, regenerative everything, basically, but not from a place of urgency. I'm no longer feeling that there's this urgency. It's too late for that. We're, we're already in runaway mode. There are systems that already have triggered a runaway mode. We're into an abrupt climate change era. We've been 35 years into an abrupt climate change. An abrupt climate change is like 10,000 years of climate change in a half a human lifetime. That began in the 1980s. And, and we're in an exponential decline of every single system with no exceptions that I'm aware of that humans depend upon. So you have people like Steven Pinker and the other prophets of progress who can talk accurately and have charts that show how many things are getting better for for at least the elite and you know the wealthiest of humans but they fail to notice or to even mention that that is only allowed by the precipitous decline i mean we're not talking just decline we're talking about precipitous freefall of every single system that humans depend upon soil forests water fisheries climate and on and on and on and so, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look out and say, oh, right, this is unsustainable radically. And the fact is, though, we're, we're in a runaway mode. So if you're in a runaway mode where whether there are any humans whatsoever 100 years from now, which I think there's a decent chance that there could be. I think that there, a vision that, well, first of all, I do think it's possible. It's very possible that we could see the extinction of humanity this century. No question. It could happen in the next 20 years if the Arctic wigs out in a really serious way. Because I think that one of the things that's in runaway mode is the great conflagration. We will see virtually every year, there may be a pause for one year or two at the most, but we're going to see forests like happening in now where you're in your part of the world, in California and Oregon and Washington and British Columbia, Australia. We will see that get worse every single year. Most of the forests of the world will be burning in the next 20 to 30 years, regardless if every human being woke up tomorrow morning committed to doing the right thing, that's in runaway mode. Uh, permafrost is in runaway mode. Uh, the shrinking of the Arctic sea ice extent, basically soon within a dozen years, possibly the next few years, a blue ocean event where all of this heat that was being reflected uh, uh, into back into space by the ice is now being absorbed by the dark blue ocean, which then releases more methane, which then causes more heat and so on. So this is what I mean by, by abrupt runaway climate change. And so in that context, it's no longer urgent. It's just a matter of, wow, the times are sobering. So let us act with compassion. I, I like the words love and action better than activism. What does love motivate you to do? And at what scale can you do it that nurtures your soul, that nurtures your body, that nurtures your relationships? And that's usually going to be locally. It's going to be your neighbors, your friends, your immediate family. So, I mean, here we just moved in two weeks ago. I already know oh, most of the neighbors. People walk down the street. Hi, are you a neighbor? Oh, yeah, I'm Michael and Connie. We just moved in here. What's your name? You don't have to write it down. You know? <laughs> I want to get to know my neighbors before the poop hits the fan, you know. So. That's that's yeah. I'm 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 lucky enough to have moved into a community where we do a lot of things to take care of one another, particularly in relation to things like fire danger. But also, we get together and uh, dance in the streets when the smoke is low enough. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you do. My God. <laughs> yeah. Well. You're getting into the territory where I wanted to wanted to arrive. I think that for most people, there are a variety of responses that get interrupted by other responses. That in, in some sense, we are running multiple programs. One of those programs kind of has to do with uh, the fact that almost everybody who's going to hear these words was raised in a society that had a collective dream of progress that was telling us, inculcating in us uh, the idea that we would 
be able to live in the same kinds of security and plenty uh, would, would, would always be improving, that our whole narrative of progress is, is, is like baked into not just stories about the world, but stories about our lives and stories about meaning and what a life well lived is. And we're in a moment right now in which there are many forms of collective madness. There are conspiracy theories. There are a variety of completely specious uh, narratives that are being uh, designed and promulgated purposely for the benefit of factions. And we are dismayed to see others go crazy. We ourselves are prey to uh, connecting the dots of our chaotic data about our world in ways that hallucinate all kinds of uh, stories. Some of them, the, the, the most dangerous of them, cast everything as a good versus evil narrative where we get pumped up in righteous indignation and a kind of rage that has us closer to a breakdown of our sense of any common humanity with whoever is on the other side of this good versus evil narrative. And, you know, the, the, sometimes this is described as a meaning crisis or a, a, a breakdown of our information ecology. You know, you can think of it as a, a problem of the incentive structures of capitalism. Uh, there, there are a lot of different analyses. But we're not just dealing with the ecological, the ecological problems are most foundational, but there are problems in our minds and in our collective mind that are almost as acute and might even be the triggers for the kinds of big breakdowns that are most concerning. So how, how are you, in most contexts, you're asked a question in order to offer whatever clarities you have. And I do want that, but I always want to invite you to you know, utter whatever your clarity is, and then step past that into whatever the next question is that's arising to your heart. Yeah, yeah, great. Wow. Well, one of the things that I will say just from personal experience is that what evaporates confusion and um, unclarity uh, far more rapidly and effectively than anything else is bringing to mind a deep understanding of ecology and history. That when you really get ecological patterns and how they always work and have for billions of years, and when you understand historical patterns of boom and bust civilizations, progress, regress, and then you understand especially when bringing those two together, the ecological and the historical and realize that with very few exceptions, virtually every city-based civilization, human-centered, anthropocentric civilization, um, has committed suicide by first experiencing population pressure. That when you have more people, then you have energy. And again, for 98% of human history, energy was trees. Uh, until the fossil fuel era. So, you know, that's why um, uh, John Perlin's book, The F uh, Forest Journey, is this relentless, detailed articulation of civilization after civilization after civilization after civilization that wiped out the trees, the topsoil washed away. They started tr trying to take over other more foreign lands it became, until that became economically uh, uh, unaffordable, and then the civilization collapses. And so population pressure, when you have more people, virtually all of the things that you look around, and if you open up the New York Times and the Guardian and you know Washington Post and Fox News or wherever, you're going to be reading stories that are in fact caused by population pressure, but none of it's articulated. Nobody understands that. So you're going to see it's it's racism, it's sexism, it's thisism, it's thatism, it's this, it's the deformation, it's, it's fake news, it's all that. And all that's true at a superficial level. But when you understand population pressure, then you can just sit back and say, oh, right, of course, of course, of course, we're going to see this. And that allows me, at least, having that historical and ecological perspective to basically uh, not be thrown off with all of the crazy making crazy stuff that we find in the news 
and live each day, one day at a time, focusing on how to be in integrity. That's right relationship to reality. But I don't insist that other people do that. I did for, you know, first 12 years of my ministry or, you know, whatever. But now it's more along the lines of people are going to be doing the best they can, given what they've got to work with. I do invite them to understand things ecologically and historically, which Jen can bring your heart to a place of, oh gosh, wow. Yeah, this is this is pretty much inevitable. And then to find those places in themselves and then in their communities, however they define their communities, um, because we don't have the luxury. Those of us who have been awakened to or come to an understanding of ecological reality, historical reality, um, uh, you know, co- you know, our relationship to the cosmos, that we are not separate from nature. We are part of nature. We're an expression of the grace of nature. That, in fact, if we treat that being, call it the biosphere, as a greater thou, not a lesser it, we can be sustainable. If we treat primary reality as merely a source of resources and a place for our waste, we self-destruct. This is, this is what we understand from history. So having a personal, intimate, I-thou relationship with what we call nature, the biosphere, the living world, is I suggest that's the fundamental spiritual discipline that every person listening to this conversation can take on. In addition to grounding my heart, my own soul, my thinking, and my actions in an ecological and historical perspective, the two things that Connie and I are regularly do for ourselves and we encourage for others is one, to understand, and we've taught on this for the whole time of, of you know, the 19 years of our itinerant ministry, and, and now that we're just settled down, we, I imagine continuing to teach on this, this understanding that death is sacred, death is necessary, death is holy, uh, and that you can't even have a universe without death. And the combination of that with a sense of identity, that myself doesn't stop with my skin, that in a very real and totally deep way, my larger body is the biosphere, is the solar system, is the Milky Way, is the universe, and is whatever that great mystery is in which this universe and possible multiple other universes is part of. So myself is this larger this universal self and or cosmic self or, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, but when you realize that, when I realize that, then I'm no longer, not only am I not afraid of my own death, but I'm not afraid of our species death because my sense of identity is with that, you know, and, and um, as long as any other species, even if it's just forms of bacteria survive myself, my larger self continues into the future. So, for me, that sense of identity with, with both time and space, identity with the ancestors, including the pre-human ancestors, identity with my descendants, including the other than human descendants, because our species will go extinct. Whether it's in the next 10 years or the next 5 million years, it's probably going to be in that window somewhere. And then life will continue. Species will come and go. Glaciers will come and go. The earth will continue to spin. The moon will do its thing. The Milky Way will do its thing. And life can, goes on. So that sense of identity shift is huge and can make an, a, a ginormous difference in people's emotional state and spiritual state. And the second is that sense of that death is natural, it's sacred, it's no less sacred than life. And that, that you know, Connie and I have done years and years of programs on a sacred science approach, a meaningful, inspiring sacred science approach to mortality and death. That's why we, we love, we just last night or two nights ago, I think we watched Stephen Jenkinson's uh, Grief Walker, which we've watched a dozen times, um, and um, and then rewatched my post-doom conversation with Stephen Jenkinson. So those two things, in addition to having an ecological and historical understanding, that's more rational, that's more intellectual, but then at the emotional, spiritual, relational level, that expanded sense of identity, that my larger self and then that sense of that death and mortality is sacred, necessary. Uh, that ha- those those two things have made the biggest difference on a day by day, week by week, month by month basis for me and Connie too. And it's the heart of what we share. Certainly at the heart of this collapse and adaptation primer. These two videos uh, that I that I mentioned. Well, I appreciate that, and you know I resonate with all of these 
you know, you have enriched my life and understanding in many important ways. And so I, I'm by no means pushing away the truths you're speaking. But, and, by, and by the way, Michael, I do want to say something to our listeners. That I make a great deal of room for a collapsitarian orientation. And, there, and, and, and I think you've argued for it really eloquently and persuasively here in this conversation. And I more or less resonate with it, but it is my experience that too often uh, collapsitarian narratives begin to acquire a bit more certainty than I think is appropriate. I think that at ground, a sense of wonder and possibility, and we really don't know that it's true that the methods of Newtonian science are pretty good at predicting a lot of things, and that the ecological facts point in exactly the directions you have described. And to to fiddle with that too much, as in in order to feel hopeful, is a way of deluding ourselves. And I acknowledge all of that. And this is a wild reality in which. Everyone has always been surprised. You know, there has, we've never been able to predict our future fully. And so a certain relaxation of certainty, not, not in service to our anxious need to imagine a sunny future, but with a sense that our own orientation, you know, in a quantum reality, observers part of the picture and material, you know, subjective and objective reality are not too. And we're in a moment where our attitudes can have some effect, you know, as a self-fulfilling prophecy. And too much certainty of dark futures isn't, for me, the way I want to relate to your granddaughter, and 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 if there's another generation beyond her to the, like my solidarity they don't want us to be a prayer for inevitable darkness they want us to be a prayer for miraculous possibility in some part of our soul and yet they don't want us to be d- deluded and uh, self-servingly uh, uh attached to uh uh, Pollyanna-ish narratives. They they want us to face reality. So I think it's it's just important for me in the midst of this, because I am resonating with the collapsitarian narrative you're offering. And I appreciate it. And I'm grateful to you for bringing it forward. And it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. We live in a a, 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 to some real degree, a miraculous universe. Qualities of emergence may appear in ways we don't expect. We're all going to die. We're all going to suffer before we die. We're all going to enjoy blessings before we die. And we're together in all of that. But we're also together in a great I don't know. And I want that uh, to be said just just so that I'm not resonating with the point of view you're putting forth so much that I abandon aspects of what is important to me. Sure, sure. I get that. And you, you've you consistently um, uh, been a call to other leaders to have epistemic humility, to, to not be overly certain, to not be overly cocky or confident or arrogant, especially with respect to collapse and uh, those sorts of things. And I and I greatly appreciate you for that. I want to come back to the the last chapter of Catton's book Overshoot makes the compelling case, in my opinion, that the only way to not be a curse to future generations worse than we are already doing is to hold out hope. The best thing that we can do is assume the worst and act from that place, because as he says, Humanity is locked into stealing ravenously from the future. Our indispensable hope, basically, he says that the human self-restraint 
practice both individually and especially collectively is our indi indispensable hope. And we will not voluntarily restrain ourselves, downshift our energy use, our consumption patterns, as long as we hold out hope uh, for some miraculous way to keep this wasteful industrial uh, anti-future system going. Yeah. And so I, I've, uh, in preparation for this conversation, I thought, okay, there are certain forms of certainty that are toxic. There are certain forms of certainty that are relationally toxic. Um, uh, think about any relationship, somebody who's arrogant or certain about something. I mean, it's, it's, it's difficult. I mean, I, I think Guy McPherson, had he not stated things like every human being is going to go extinct by, you know, 2030 or whatever. And he simply said, you know, the evidence that I see, it thinks that there's at least a 98% chance that's the case. He wouldn't have had so much pushback. It's that certainty, the toxic certainty that many people respond to. So I thought, what are some certainties that I think that we can hold and ground ourselves in that are spiritually nurturing and actually humility generating certainties? And I just got a few that I outlined, basically five, geological and biological certainties, climatological certainties, linguistic certainties, cultural and civilizational certainties, and then psychological. And I just have a few notes. So geological and biological certainties, we can be sure that dense energy allows us to do things that diffuse energy doesn't. The second law of thermodynamics is real. And that um, that energy return on energy invested, like how, you know, we used to be able to invest one unit of energy and get 100 back at the earliest of the petroleum era. Now it's like 15 to 1. And so the decline of in of civilizational complexity is always aligned with declining net energy. And so in that sense, it is it is not arrogant to have the, the certainty of civilizational decline. It's the recognition that to hold out hope of anything but that is to allow us to continue patterns that our great, our grand, our children and our grandchildren should life continue to, to allow for humans even to be, um, we'll see that as a curse. They'll experience that. And so that humans are a subset of the body of life. This is, a, again, a geological and biological certainty. And any part of this nested subsystem that tries to control the system for itself will ultimately cause uh, it, its own self-destruction. So that's, I think, geological and biological certainties. The other one is that we have to exist within carrying capacity. There's a limit to how much we can take and a limit to how much we could exude before the systems break down. So the, as John Michael Greer says, the, the first law of life is limits. And I think original sin is the violation of grace limits. It's the thinking that's, that's the original sin of civilizations is we thought we could be limitless. Um, so climatological certainties is that basically climate is God, <laughs> that there's no force in the universe that more consistently brings cultures into being, sustains them and destroys them than climate. And so uh, abrupt climate change is this pattern of 10,000 years of climate change in a single human lifetime or half a human lifetime. And it seems that we're already 30 to 35 years into that. So then it's now just the grace of the universe, the grace of life, the grace of God, whether humans exist at all, 50 years from now, or whether some remnant, but there will be a trimming down of population. Um, linguistic certainties, that words create worlds, that whether we, whether, if we have a personal name for primary reality, like Gaia or God or whatever, if we have a personal name for the oceans, you know, Poseidon is a personal name. The oceans is an impersonal name. What we name primary reality influences profoundly our relationship to primary reality. So having personal names for reality uh, uh, facilitates a more humble, usually facilitates a more humble relationship. And part of our predicament is we're not going to shift that, <laughs> not in our lifetime. So it's not like we're going to all start using divine, personal, mythic names for reality. It's just not going to happen. Um, but that, that secular speech and mythic speech, that is personification speech, both are as essential as the two halves of our brain. So that's, I think, a linguistic certainty. Cultural civilizational certainty is that in unsustainable cultures, city-based, human-centered, agricultural civilizations, collapse is a feature. It's not a bug. It always is there. It's never not been there. And the sooner that we can accept that and recognize, oh, the patterns 
of collapse are very similar in many, 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 many cultures. So, so then it becomes not like trying to stop collapse, nor trying to speed it up, but just recognizing, oh my gosh, we're in collapse. We're decades into collapse. And I can be with that. So it's not an arrogant certainty, but it's not holding out hope for some miraculous uh, techno-utopian transformation. And then finally, psychological certainties, which is denial is inevitable. Denial is deeply rooted. Um, it's for good psychological reasons. There's, there's such a thing as called adaptive inattention. There's people that don't deny climate change, but they don't want to think about it on a day-by-day -day basis because they realize there's nothing we can do about it. And so adaptive inattention is a form of denial, and it's actually pretty healthy. Um, and so uh, we can be generous and compassionate with ourselves and with each other because these are challenging times. We are in decline. We're in collapse. Much of that is inevitable. Some of it, you know, it's that old 12-step prayer. God, life, reality, help me accept the things I can't change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And so that's where we, that discernment process is so vital. So I think there are, I appreciate your call for epistemic humility. I appreciate your call to not be overly certain, but I think there are some things that we can be certain about that actually induce a more generous, humble and relational way of being because we're not feeling urgency, we're not feeling fear, and we're not feeling judgment. It takes away the blame game. When you realize, oh gosh, this is what's going on, then all of that need to blame others, the other party, these people, the, the boomers, all the stuff, that sort of evaporates the blame this, game. Th this is the beauty of what uh, Peter Russell puts forward. His analysis is not primarily ecologically based. It's really a, a pattern-based uh, recognition that the uh, creativity of human beings builds upon itself in an, an inherently self-accelerating cycle that ultimately overloads the uh, limits, uh, hardwired neurological limits of human beings, if if not the ecological limits. And 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 his orientation then is well, let's just relax all this blame. Where we're all caught in a bigger pattern than anyone is personal culpability for. Uh, on the other hand, there are some issues here that I think we ought to go into more fully. And I want to name a couple of them uh, before I, I, I pause for a moment. One of them is, you said, uh, well, I can be with that. And, and I think you're sincere in saying that. But what you didn't name is the process of the shock of our collective mortality activating all the embedded trauma from all kinds of personal and other and, and other collective experiences such that people at times feel immobilized and it doesn't name the way that grief is a transformative medicine a river we have to cross in order not to be superficial and, yes, yes. That, that, and 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 then there's a, a, a another issue that has to do with the fact that this is cyclical that whatever acceptance we find our way to is not permanent the awesome reality of what we are in the midst of will transform us in ways we cannot prefigure as much as we can get ahead of it and in some sense integrate what we can see we have to be humbly before a profundity death you know one of jenkinson's main points about death is that our ideas about our death prior to being in the grips of it are superficial to the profundity of the process itself and that it is so radically humbling that signing a, a, a final direct health directive or whatever is done by a very different person than the person to which it's going to be applied, that all our strategies are inadequate to the profundity of the mystery of our own, even individual mortality. And what could be greater than all the collective unconscious and mythic resonances of bigger mortalities. One of the things that, that uh, is, is here is us with one another, 
on behalf of each of us with every single listener to these words, joining hands in a kind of tender, prayerful place. To some degree, my best integrity come from me getting off of it, really, really putting my bending my knees and putting my forehead on the earth and in a deep, deep sense, surrendering open to be changed, to be a, a, a prayer for possibility, whatever that is, just of, of love and acceptance in the midst of, 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 our, of our demise. I don't want to be uh, in resistance to reality, but I don't want to be in a uh, a, a strategic attempt to accept so that it's all pre-solved, so that my uh, uh, equanimity is uh, undisturbed. I, I, my attachment to uh, even my, my equanimity can be a kind of egoity. So, so I, I'm just wanting to presence the, the profundity of the mystery that we're in well, turning back to you, Michael, appreciating all the wisdom that you're saying, and yet challenging you to go beyond the pose of equanimity into the profound transformative cauldron that does include grief and disorientation. What's arising yeah. for you right now? Yeah, let me, let me clarify, because by having an extended sense of self uh, that I am one with time and nature, that I'm in a, that, 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 that I, I feel a deep, that, that, that my ancestors, including my pre-human ancestors, still live. They live in me. I don't exist without them. And that the larger body of life, the biosphere, the ecosphere, the cosmos, is my larger self um, in the same way that, you know, apples grow out of an apple tree, humans grow out of the universe, we grow out of Gaia. And so that sense, it does give me a sense of equanimity, but it doesn't take away the grief. I still feel the grief. Grief is essential. I don't ever want to be post grief because grief helps me feel the deep love with life. So when I read about things happening to other species and around the world and people living with, with, with fires and, 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 there, and, and so many people losing their jobs and of being afraid of, or in some cases, not just afraid of, but living out on the street now, they don't have a, you know, I mean, there's all of this. I feel grief and I don't ever want to not feel grief. Um, and gratitude. They're not mutually exactly. exclusive. Exactly. Part of, part of, for me, celebrating the ecstasy of life is the ecstasy of the profound grief that I'm capable of feeling. And, 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 and yet also the, like the, the stupendous, like, holy, oh my God, what a joy to be alive. I'm looking out at these trees, these silver maples and just waving in the wind and just to be conscious. So oh, both of those, it's like that scene at the end of Stephen Jenkinson's Grief Walker, where he says, you know, our, our celebration of life our, and, and grief, you know, clinking, you know, glasses at, you know, the, the banquet. So yeah, all of that's real. And I don't ever want to be beyond that. So for me, post doom and post gloom isn't being beyond that. And in, in this place of perfect equanimity, not at all. It's simply recognizing that life is full of agony and ecstasy. And I want to experience the fullness of it every day, you know, you know, to my last day. And but I do hold a deep grounding in ecology and evolution about the rightness, the inevitability of certain things that allows me to be with what really triggers so many of my friends and colleagues and others that triggers their anger, triggers their confusion, triggers their judgment, their self-righteousness, their fears. Those don't get triggered in me because I have an understanding like, oh, gosh, of course, of course, of course, this is the way empires and civilizations contract. Of course, of course, of course, this is what unsustainable civilizations go through. Of course, of course, of course, this is the ways that population pressure shows itself. Um so, yeah, I didn't want to give you the wrong impression that from that, you know, living in perfect equanimity is what I'm about, nor what this post gloom and post doom perspective that, that I'm offering uh, is about. It's not at all. Good, because in a way that means that you are joining with every listener who is at, you know, we can imagine different listeners, each being at different 
points along this journey into facing all of what is present here. Th this is an ordeal. It's, it's, it's an ordeal to face the fact that you might be diminished. I, I was very, very deeply affected by a scene in uh, a movie called The Pianist about uh, uh, Warsaw Ghetto. And in one scene, there was people were starving and a woman had sold all her jewels and everything for a bowl of soup an older woman and an old man came and tried to steal it from her and ended up jostling her so that it fell onto the cobblestones. And he got down on his hands and knees and lapped the soup off the ground that, that he stole from this woman, you know, under those circumstances. He was so degraded by the privation that he became such an ugly being, you know, it was, it was, it was kind of horrifying that, that, he, maybe he wasn't the greatest guy in the world previously, but he was driven to something pretty, pretty ugly. And at first, my response was just, ah, oh, that is so disgusting. I would never be like that. Like, I, I just defined myself in, in, in an emotional way. Like, ah, that is exactly what I would never want to be or do. And, and then I, I, I took from that, okay break through the vanity of that self-image and recognize yeah. that it yeah. probably is possible for circumstances to be created where you too would be debased. Do not imagine that you're immune to that kind of yeah. debasement. That, that, and that humbled me a great deal. So there's something in the orientation to all of this that I think needs some of that kind of humility. Like we just don't know what the circumstances will be. And we want to give as much heart and, 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 and friendship and, and, and be with one another in all of what this is, however hard it is, however much it is an ordeal. And we want to be with each other in the joyous celebration of this beautiful moment in which I look at the sky and I can't see much of the sky because there's smoke everywhere right now. And yet just the light is, there's something here that is the sacred, amazing reality that has given birth to everything. And I don't want to only see the glass half empty. I, I want to be a resurgent celebrant of the sacrament of everything the present moment. And I'm growing in my ability to do that, even as I really want to stay humble before the yeah. tests and lessons of this epochal transition time. Oh my God. Yes, 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 exactly. <laughs> wow. Well, Connie reminded me that a, a super important concept that I first learned from John Michael Greer. I think I've recorded nine of his books unofficially, and I've recorded one officially, um, all with his permission and the publisher's permission, but yeah, they're all available up on SoundCloud. Um, but his concept of dissensus, dissensus being the, the, uh, the deliberate refusal of premature consensus. It's the valuing of differences and different perspectives to such a degree because we don't know what natural selection will select on. We just don't know. And so the fact that you and I have some differences and I and virtually all my colleagues and friends have differences, to me, that's a really good thing. I don't want that not to be the case. I don't want you to think and feel like me. I, I think that our differences are vital and that valuing of dissensus, the, the, the refusal of premature consensus, is the best thing for the future and it's the best thing for the larger body of life upon which we depend because we just don't know which, which uh, adaptations, which mutations, which, which uh, divergences you know, uh, will be fruitfully selected for in the future um, and will be most life-giving because the environment that is our, uh, you know, our surrounding, everything is going to shift. Tomorrow will be different, the next day, the next week, the next month, whatever. So I want to really bring that concept of dissensus in 
because I think that just even grounding that is is epistemically hu- humble. It's recognizing that my position may feel really right to me. It may really feel evidence grounded, but that doesn't mean that others don't have equally valid or even more helpful to the future perspectives, orientations, groundings, that uh, and that sort of thing. So I just want to bring that concept of the census into this conversation. Mm. Mm. Yes, the census. It's important that we honor that other perspectives than our own might bring something of value and therefore not be too arrogant. And yet what I most want to do is to be with all of this with you and with every listener and with every friend. I want for us not to disappear into the hallucination of the our identity being only this separate ego, skin encapsulated, isolated, and having its own separate experience. I want to break through that in tangible human ways. I want our our friendship at every friendship, even the friendships that are sort of virtual, people who appreciate what you say or what I say, who don't know us personally, to be less alone in the enormity of all that we are integrating and to be present to the wonder that, you know, if we think of this as being a single being, this great evolutionary being who has been being all this amazing universe from the beginning. It is also being a particular kind of individuated, self-aware consciousness in communion with other points of consciousness, becoming self-aware even of its own self-destructive process. The wonder of that being known and fully, heartfully experienced and all that is good and true and beautiful in the human being being called forward in new ways by it. Let's be together at least in that. And, and it, that feels like the uh, even more important than our having uh, a more accurate picture of something we imagine to be subjective. Let's break out of that subjectivity into the, the human family alive to the wonder and mystery and horror and 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 heartbreak of it all. Yes, yes. So the yes. the helping one another uh, be less alone in the full glorious catastrophe seems like one of the one of the things we can do with each other as friends and with everyone who we have the privilege of of speaking with and being an influence upon. Yeah, that, I mean, you just put your finger on what for me has become, I would say, the most valued thing for me about these post-Doom conversations. Again, postdoom.com. But, you know, I've had 75 conversations with people and I now am nurturing a closer collegial friendship with a huge number of them. And I feel so less alone. I feel so connected to a community of people who get the dark side, who get collapse, and yet have done the hard work and are in action in whatever ways love motivates them to be in action at whatever scale they can be and can really serve as models. One of the things I encourage people to do as they watch or listen to these post-Doom conversations is see who are the people that occur to you as exemplars as as potential mentors that you may want to explore their work more deeply or whatever because i think that you know we don't have the luxury of staying in denial uh, those of us who get this those of us who are on a spiritual path that you know we are in the early stages of the greatest mental health crisis in human history and uh and it's and there are differences between preconditions and triggers and preconditions are things like overshoot abrupt climate change and so on and then there's triggers like the covid-19 you know and things like that and we're now at these early stages of we're probably in the early stages of the next great depression where you know who knows what chaos is going to emerge before during and after this upcoming election um, you know, there's just so many uncertainties. 
And so those of us, I think, who really are listening to this conversation and the people who are watching and listening to my post-Doom conversations, it's really, uh, we are, it's time, it's time for us to step up our game because we're going to be needed. We're going to be needed by our neighbors. We're going to be needed by our family. We're going to be needed by our friends. We're going to be needed by our communities uh, to help them when they start freaking out. Uh, we need to be a faithful guide. And that's what your work is all about. That's what my work is about. And I think that that's, uh, it is holy work. And it is being held in a sense of the joy of living with full acceptance of, of mortality. And, and that's, that's, that's holy ground, it seems to me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love you, brother. <laughs> I love the work that you do. I love your heart. I love your mind. Um, I love our friendship. Yeah, me too. <laughs>